invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22 is our text, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's not a problem. Uh, if you're here at Sweetwater, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker campus, there's a table in the back with Bibles on it. Go back there and grab one of those and turn to page 983, and you will find our text, uh, Matthew 22. And as always, if you're here and... Uh, you don't have a Bible, you want one, you want to read God's Word, but you don't have access to it, then please take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. Seriously, we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, let me tell you about a couple of things I'm really excited about uh, uh, as you're finding Matthew 22, getting your, your pens out, getting the notes already, that kind of stuff. Uh, first of all, uh, it's Christmas season. Whether you want it to be Christmas season or not. And we, it's Christmas season because we're already handing out the Christmas backpacks. Uh, and, and, you know, Jordan mentioned that earlier and, and just kind of uh, uh, told you a little bit about it. But last year, we put together as a church about 900 backpacks that we took to boys and girls uh, from Mexico uh, to two different tribal nations, uh, to California, to uh, needy kids down on the border. Uh, I mean, it's awesome. They're all over the place where we get to, to bless children in Jesus' name and tell them about the hope that we have in Christ. Yeah. And, and I love that. So we've got about 900 backpacks uh, to give out uh, at all of our campuses uh, total. So I'm just going to encourage you to pick one up and do some shopping because uh, some of you like to shop. Men, if you don't like to shop, then just pick them up and say, here, honey, we're doing this, and uh, you got my blessings. <laughs> I'll drive you to Walmart if you need me to. Uh, it's okay. We're, we're in this together. So whatever it works, however it works for you. But uh, I'm excited about that. I'm also excited because we are about one year away from our next Holy Land trip. And uh, we've been talking about this for about six months, not, not a whole lot. But it's uh, now getting inside that 12-month window. And next Saturday night, the tw uh, 23rd of September, right after our evening service, our 5 o'clock service, we're going to have a meeting here in the sanctuary uh, at Sweetwater. If you want some information about that, it's not a commitment. It's just information that some of you have been asking questions and this is a meeting. So if you want to know about the Holy Land trip for, that's planned for the end of November 2020, uh, we're going to have that information. There are brochures out at the Connection Center at all of our campuses. So if you want to pick one of those up and look at it, come with your questions. We, uh, I, this is, I've been three times. It's awesome. It's, it's life-changing. You learn a whole bunch of stuff that you thought you knew, but now you know, what a lot, oh, know it a whole lot better. So uh, if you're interested in that, then show up next week, and we'll try to answer your questions. And, uh, and, and you can get on the list or figure out how to put your deposit in. Some, some have already put their deposits in. We're going to have a blast. So, uh, have you ever thrown a party and nobody showed up? Any, anybody had that uh, happen to, to you? Okay, a, a couple of hands go up. I, I feel your pain. You know, but, I, you know, you cook, you clean, you, you get stressed about people coming and about how the house looks. You got everything perfect, and then the guests don't show up. So frustrating. You know what's worse than that? It's like one person shows up. Because then it's like awkward conversation. Do you send them home? How long do you wait before you call it a failure? And just go. But uh, it's just really awkward. So uh, I threw a party that nobody came to uh, professionally. So this was like a, a major failure. I was in Georgia. I was uh, the youth pastor at the church. And the senior pastor said, we're going to have a marriage and family conference. Uh, and he said, you plan it. I was like, great. I'll plan the conference. You promote it. I planned it. And uh, we planned for like, you know, 100 to 200 people. We had breakout seminars, uh, the main speaker, all this stuff, all the volunteers in place, child care arranged, everything. And about 20 to 30 people showed up. Yeah, it was awkward the whole weekend. Can I just tell you that? It was incredibly awkward uh, when you're expecting 230 show up. Uh, that's embarrassing. It's frustrating. It's no fun. So today we're looking at a story that Jesus told about a party. And it's a party where initially no one showed up. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1, says, And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. The king, uh, and he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. 
And again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Interesting story, isn't it? So we're continuing our moral of the story series. You read Jesus' stories, and they make you scratch your head. They make you kind of go, okay, now what does that mean? Okay, so here's some things I want you to see in the story. First of all, the kingdom of God is a party. The kingdom of God is a party. I don't know if you caught that. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. The kingdom of God is compared uh, to a wedding feast. Isn't that interesting? A wedding feast for the son. Now, it just so happens, not coincidentally, but actually planned, that the Apostle John, when he was describing the end of things as we know it, described a wedding celebration of Jesus and the church, his bride. Revelation 19, if you want to read it. And, and, and so it, it, it's this whole party that Jesus is talking about. Is he's pointing to the one at the end. But the kingdom of God is a party. Now think about this. this, is this we, we live in the kingdom of God, and this is a celebration of Jesus and his victory over sin and death and hell and his resurrection from the dead and, and his, his, the fact that he has purchased us and redeemed us and given us life. The kingdom of God is a party. So do you live like the kingdom of God is a party? Hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I went to a lot of churches growing up. Not one of them resembled a party. <laughs> can, I, can I just be honest? There was not a lot of celebration. They were serious, somber, boring. Okay? Now, I confess, I had fun at church, but I usually got in trouble for it when I got caught. So, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it just, it was way more like a, a funeral than a wedding. I do a lot of both. And I'm just telling you, there's a marked difference in the atmosphere. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, the churches I went to, were more, now, now they had parties. They called them fellowships. They do them rarely on Sunday nights when there were no witnesses. And, and if you did stuff and had too much fun, then people would complain, especially if the preacher was involved. And there'd be people who would say, well, that wasn't very dignified of the preacher. So I just removed that from the equation. I'm never dignified, so nobody has any expectations of that. So it makes it a lot easier. We just don't do that. We're not, but, but, you know, it, was, it, it just wasn't a party. So that's how I grew up. And then, and then I read the Bible. By the way, I recommend it highly. You read it. You find out really cool stuff. Do you know one of the major themes in Scripture is joy? The word joy or rejoice is used over 400 times in the Bible. 400 times. You think if God mentions something 400 times, it may be it's important? I'm just saying, you know, it's kind of like he's saying it over and over and over again uh, throughout Scripture. I, I mean, Jesus said, uh, look, I told you these things so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. Now think about that. Jesus said, look, I want my joy to be in you, which means Jesus has joy in him. I mean, it's his wedding feast. It's his party. He's got joy in him, and he wants his joy to be in you. And then he says, I want your joy to be full. 
See, that could be me, and I just go, how many of you have full joy, or how many of you are just like trying to muster up a little bit of joy so you can have a little, and, and, and see, the reality is most of us are not living like the kingdom of God is a party. And yet the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Do you guys know what the second one is? Joy. I mean, it's ranked high. It's number two. There's a reason self-control is number nine. Now, that's bad thinking because if that was the case, patience wouldn't make the list, and it's number four. Right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the, the, the character of Christ that he wants us to live, and joy is up there. How is it that we can discount it and not focus on it and go, hey, a spiritual discipline, a result of being close to Jesus, is joy in our lives. And then the Apostle Paul, he's just annoying because he says, hey, I want you guys to rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. He had a re repetition problem too. Over and over and over again, the kingdom of God is a party. God wants to fill your life with joy because we are celebrating the victory of Jesus. That, that, that's what we're living in. So that means if, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you actually believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you've, won, you've already won the game. You've already won. You, this, is, this is amazing truth. This is the gospel. You can't lose when you're on Team Jesus. It's impossible because Jesus won. He actually declared victory on the cross. He said, it is finished. I won. I won. He's won. And if you're a part of his family, then you're a part of the winning team. You cannot lose. You go, yeah, well, sometimes I feel like I'm losing. I feel like things are, are, are going bad. Well, then remember, remind yourself, hey, guess what? Jesus won. He conquered sin and death and hell. I'm on his team. So even when I feel like I'm losing... I'm not. You're not. You gotta remind yourself. You go, well, but life is crushing me. It's just terrible. Everything's falling apart. Can I remind you that the, because of Jesus, it only gets better? I mean, that is kind of the promise. You guys do realize that no matter how bad your life crashes and burns, heaven is still ahead. Right? You go, yeah, but. Look at me, my body's falling apart, it's betraying me, I can't do this, I can't do that, it hurts. And, and, and guess what? You get a new one. You get to trade in that old, decrepit model. Oh, I'm sorry, did I just call some of you old and decrepit? <laughs> I get to trade in my old, decrepit model, and I get a new one? There's no more suffering, sorrow, death, or pain. It's, it's all new. I mean, come on, this is, this is what's ahead of us. This is what it means to live with the attitude that the kingdom of God is a party. This is what joy comes from, is living in that reality and reminding ourselves day in and day out that we're going to win. You go, yeah, but life hurts. I'm seriously in pain. The Apostle Paul, Romans 8.18, and, and if you don't know this verse, you need to look it up, you need to mark it, you need to memorize it. He said, I do not consider the present sufferings worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. This is a guy who knew suffering really well. Really, really well. He, his life had been pain, and he said it's not worth comparing. In other words, no matter how tough it is, no matter how bad it is, no matter how awful it is, the moment you step into eternity, you're going to go like, okay, it was worth it. It was totally worth it. What? I don't even remember that stuff. That's not worth comparing. And by the way, if you've been betrayed or rejected, so is Jesus. Right after he said, I want my joy in you, and I want your joy to be full. Betrayed and rejected. And, and, and he's the one who's promising victory. So you just hold on to him. And yeah, sometimes that's all you can do. You got, I just got to hold on to Jesus. But still remind yourself, we can't lose. Because of the price that Jesus paid on the cross, because he redeemed us from death, then the kingdom of God is a party. So are you celebrating that reality? Are you living with that reality? Are you acting like you're on the winning team? Because one of my pet peeves is, is, you know, Christians and churches that are so upset about how terrible the world is. Oh, it's all getting bad. And it's all going to hell in a handbasket. Look what they're doing and this and that and, and social media, this and the public. Look, 
Guys, I, I read all that stuff. I see all that stuff. Can I just remind you? We win. We win, so stop whining. Okay, if, if you're going to win, then be a good winner and don't whine. Be gracious, be kind, be loving. It's a reality, and if we believe that reality, it'll change the way we think because the kingdom of God is a party. Because the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So the story begins describing a celebration, but that quickly turns sour. Now, this is a prophetic story that Jesus tells, so let's talk about the history of rejection. The history of rejection. I know, it, it's a party, but it's a party where no one came. So this story is a history of God's interaction with Israel, the, his chosen people. And God is inviting them to the party, celebrating his son, who happens to be the Messiah, the chosen one, the one that they're hoping for will restore the glory to Israel. They're hoping for the Messiah. They're waiting for the Messiah. By the way, if you talk to, to practicing Jews right now, Orthodox Jews, they're still waiting for the Messiah. But he came. And God invited him to the party. And guess what? They didn't want to come. They, they, were, they were too busy. I mean, they were the intended guests. They were the invited guests. They were the ones that the servants came to. But how did they respond? They ignored the notice of the party. I mean... I read the story, you know, angels showed up. There were all kinds of celebrations going on. They just missed it. Uh, by the way, I, and, and I just thought I'd mention this because uh, it's a story that's kind of weird for our culture because, you know, we can just text people, hey, let's get together at a certain time and everything's ready. Uh, that's not how parties were done back in Jesus' day because uh, they didn't know when everything was going to be cooked and everything was going to be ready. So what they do is they send their servants out to say there's going to be a party. There's going to be a celebration. There's going to be a wedding. And then it was kind of like a save the date kind of thing. But this, instead of saying save the date for Tuesday, you know, March, whatever, uh, it was like save the date for like this week. <laughs> and then when it was ready, they would send the servants out to say, okay, it's all ready. You guys can come and we're going to feast. And so they'd already been around and told everybody that, that the king was preparing this wedding feast. And then the servants went out and said, hey, come. And they're like, yeah, I'm busy. Yeah, I got to go to my farm. Yeah, I got other things to do. In other words, they just ignored the notice that the party was ready. And, and then they were unappreciative and ungrateful toward the king because when he sent the servants a second time, what did they do? They abused them. They killed them. By the way, that's kind of like the prophets and the apostles, right? If you read the story of the Old Testament, God kept sending prophets to them. They abused the prophets, ignored the prophets, you know, sometimes killed the prophets. The apostles, you know... 11 out of 12 died violent deaths. Wasn't, wasn't pretty. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you look at these things, you go, oh, this is what's happening. And that history of rejection resulted in judgment. I mean, we're talking about joy, but this is not a joyful passage. Verse 7, the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Jesus is a prophet, and he's telling what's going to happen about 40 years later when Rome sent the troops to Jerusalem. They were tired of the, the rebellions, and they besieged the city, and they conquered the city, and they laid waste to the city of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple and threw down every stone from it. 70 A.D. is when it happened. And for 1,900 years, the Jewish nation was scattered. So just, by the way, for us, if you're ignoring God, if you've been ungrateful for his blessings, if you've been rejecting the love and wisdom of Jesus, um, the Apostle Paul reminds us not to be deceived. God can't be mocked that whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. And if you sow to the flesh, you will from the flesh reap destruction. But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll from the Spirit reap life. Uh, so, you know, if you've been rejecting God, if you've been ignoring God, uh, if you've been ungrateful for His blessings, um, you can repent, which means change direction, change your attitude, uh, or there's going to be some judgment involved. The Jewish leaders rejected Jesus. They ignored God's invitation to the party, and they suffered judgment. 
Okay, so that's the history of rejection. Now let's get back to the good news. Okay, because the kingdom of God is a party. Uh, you know, I gave you the historical perspective, but here's what I want you to know also. You are invited to the party. You're invited to the party. Now, for the record, you were not the intended guests. Okay? Don't let it go to your head. Don't let it go to your heart. Don't let it bother you too much. But now we're invited. Because the original guest rejected Jesus, and he said, go out, send the servants out, go out to the highway, and, and, and get them all. Just get them all. And they did. They got the bad and the good. Did you notice that? They got the bad and the good. We can take a vote. How many of you were good? How many of you were bad? doesn't matter. Because you're invited to the party. Now, I don't know how that resonates with you, but I think that's really cool. Because I was kind of an outcast growing up. Any other outcasts in the room? Anybody else? Okay. See those hands? They're like, I'm not raising my hand. I'm going to be thrown out again. <laughs> so, look, I wasn't invited to very many parties. I'm just, for the record. Growing up, that wasn't the, that wasn't the case. I mean, part of it was because we moved a lot. I mean, 15 houses, 18 years. Uh, you know, we just, yeah, I thought we were in witness protection, but we were just crazy. <laughs> And, uh, and so I was always the new kid. But can I, can I this, is, this is really terrible. I like people. So I was always the new kid, so I, and, and I like people, but I was socially awkward. Yeah, not a good combination. So, uh, look, I wasn't even cool in my church youth group. See, the, the people who grew up in church youth groups are laughing now because they're like, that's sad. Because nobody's cool in a church youth group, but if you're not even cool in your church youth group, man. Doesn't matter. I'm invited to the biggest and best party in all of eternity. I'm included now. The King of Kings has invited me to attend his son's wedding feast. I think that's pretty awesome. And by the way, you're invited too. That, I just think that's awesome. So if you feel unloved or unwanted or invisible... If you think nobody values you or wants you around, then just know this. There is a party that includes an invitation for you. And Jesus is the guest of honor, okay? The party's not for you. It's not about you, but you're invited. Jesus wants you there. Think about that. King of kings and the Lord of lords wants you to attend his party. See, I, I said the words, but I'm not sure that really is sinking in. Because that just, I, I, I say that, I wrote this, and, and, and I'm, but I'm still just going, that is like some of the mo most awesome news you will ever hear. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, who has all power and all authority, wants you and me at his party. Desires that you show up, that you attend, that you be there. And I think that his invitation trumps every single rejection that you've ever been dealt. See, you know, the rejection hurts us, and we carry that pain around. And, and sometimes we say, well, if God really loved me, then why do you let this happen? Why do you let that person do that? Why do I have to experience that? And, and you know, it's all real. But let me, let me just tell you something. My wife turned me down for homecoming dance three years in a row. Hey, don't worry. She wasn't the only one turning me down. <laughs> there were three churches that I applied for uh, jobs at that I really wanted to work at before Calvary hired me. And they all said no, because God knows better his plans, my plans for, his plans for my life than I do. Uh, twice I lost elections as president of the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention. That's no fun. I finally was elected on the third time. Uh, but... Uh, but, you know, all, rejection happens. And none of us like to be rejected. It hurts. But here's the thing. Rejection doesn't matter because Jesus accepts me. Jesus loves me. Jesus wants me to be part of his family, to be part of his kingdom. I, I mean, th th that's crazy that Jesus died for me and died for you. Why? Because he loves us. He wanted to save you from your sins so that you could have eternal life, so that you could be at the party and live knowing that the kingdom of God is a party. I hope you know that today you are loved by God, valued by God, wanted by God. I hope you're hearing that, whether it's 
for the thousandth time or the first time. Which brings us to the moral of the story. The moral of the story is you can only join the celebration on the king's terms. This story ends weird. Can we just agree with that? I mean, because it's like the whole wedding hall is finally filled with guests. Yay! And then you get to verse 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the dude was speechless. I don't know. (laughs) Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, tie him up, cast him in the outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called, few are chosen. What in the world happened? That is such a weird ending to the story about we're all included, we're all invited to the party and and everything. But the reality is you can only join the celebration on the king's terms. Uh, So here's here's the background. When you came to this wedding feast, you were given wedding garments. Here, put these on. Kind of a cool deal. Unless they're dorky, right? But, you know, some of you are thinking, I wouldn't want to wear their clothes they picked out. That's how it was. So you came to the party. You got the wedding clothes. You put it on so you could celebrate. Uh, It's really not all that strange because if you think about it, we do the same thing uh, today, right? You go to a conference. You have to put on this lanyard or wear a badge that says, I'm in. So you can go eat at the buffet and get into the meetings, right? Let you in the door. You got to wear that. You go to a sporting event. You're going to have a ticket. And a lot of times now the tickets are digital. You wear a lanyard. You got to, you know, show it and and everything. Uh, it, it, so it's just normal that, that we do the same, same thing. So it's to identify that you were part of the wedding celebration. So there was a guy with no wedding garments. In other words, he crashed a party that he was invited to. Think about this. He crashed a party that he was invited to. Now why would you do that? In other words, he showed up, I want to come to the party, and they're like, great, come on to the party, here's your wedding clothes. So what did he do? I don't want to wear these wedding clothes. I I don't want to wear your wedding clothes. I'm not putting these on. I'm not doing it your way. Forget it. I'm just going to the party anyway. Now, uh, I've had the privilege, because I married well, to go to uh, the, the Masters Golf Tournament a number of times. And, uh, and I realize it's a privilege, and, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, and they give you the, the you know, badge and all this kind of stuff. You've got to wear it around your neck. You've got to show it. Uh, but here's the thing. When you go to Augusta National Golf Club, you've got to play by their rules or you don't get in. You know what their rules include? No cell phones. Zero cell phones. No cameras. Zero cameras. You try to smuggle in a cell phone. I mean, you're going through security, by the way, and they're looking for them. You try to smuggle one in, they'll throw you out. You're not playing by their rules. You get caught with one in the grounds, they will, I don't know if they'll tie you up, but they'll handcuff you. <laughs> and they will escort you out, and they'll confiscate your ticket, and you will never be allowed in there again. It's their party, it's their rules. And everybody, the thousands, probably 40, 50,000 people who are descending on Augusta National for those, that, that week of the Masters Golf Tournament, they all know that. They play by the rules. They, they all know it. And we all complain about it because you can't, you, we're all used to, you know, hey, where are you? Can't do that. It's a big golf course. You can get lost. You can get separated. It's like being in the 80s again. And... Uh, <laughs> So we deal with that every single day. We get this principle. Then we read the story with Jesus and we're like, that's not fair. That's not right. He got thrown out. He wasn't just because he wasn't wearing their clothes. No, because he wasn't playing by the king's rules. So God wants you at his party, but you can only come to his party on his terms. It's his rules. And there's only one rule that he has for you to get in the party. You know what that rule is? Jesus. Jesus. That's his rule. I mean, Jesus tells us that. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to get to God's party. How do you do that? By following Jesus. By becoming a follower of Jesus, by agreeing that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. 
Well, I don't know if I like that. doesn't matter. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 3. He, and some of this sounds familiar, right? But I want you to hear the whole thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For the Son did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We're all like, yay, Jesus. Then you get to verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? There's only one way in, and it's Jesus. The apostles said that, after, and they got hauled in to, you know, before the Sanhedrin because they were preaching and teaching and healing people in Jesus' name. And they said, you got to stop doing this in Jesus' name. They said, we can't because there's no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus is it. In our culture today, maybe some of you, well, you know, it's just think as long as you're sincere, as long as you believe something about God, as long as you're an adherent of a religion, then you're going to make it. You know, the only people who really, truly believe that all religions are the same are people who don't practice any of them. Can I just tell you that? Because nowhere in any world religion, I'm just going to tell you, I've studied enough of, is there a place that says, hey, believe this or one of the other guys? Every world religion kind of says, we're it, everybody else is morons, believe us or you're, or you're toast. Every one of them. The only difference is, in Christianity, God became flesh and took your sins on himself to forgive you and give you eternal life. There's only one way. There's only one rule, and the rule is Jesus. You've got to trust Jesus. You've got to follow Jesus. You've got to surrender to Jesus, and you may not like it. You may not think it's fair. You may want to protest it, but it's still true. Jesus is the ticket to God's party. So are you going to the party? So are you, are you going to the party? Okay, well, I just, well, I'm going to the party. I'm hoping that you guys are all going to the party. But see, here's the thing. If, if you just answered yes, you're going to the party, you know what that makes you now? If you're going to the party, you're in the, on the team, you're, you're a winner, so that means you're also a, a servant. You're a servant. See, we go to the party, we sign up, yeah, I'm in, I'm, and then you find out, hey, can, while, you're, while you're here, can you do what servants do? By the way, in the story, what did the servants do? They went out and got more guests. They had one job that we see in the story, and that was go out and get people because the party's not full yet. And, they, and, and you know what? They, they, they got people. Bad and good. Don't you like that? Bad goes first. We always go good and bad. Nope, Jesus went, they went and got the bad people and some of the good people. Because it doesn't matter. Everyone's welcome at the party as long as they trust Jesus, as long as they take hold of Jesus. And, and so he just wants them there. So do you know you're included in the party? A lot of you already said yes, but there's some that didn't answer. Do you know you're included in the party? If you don't know that, then I'm just going to encourage you today to decide to confess Jesus as your Savior. I've already told you what that means. If you want someone to do that with you, then come find our prayer team members here at the front. Come find me or some of the other pastors out at the Connection Center. We'd be glad to talk with you about what it means to commit your life to following Jesus Christ. But we don't want you to miss the party. But if you know you're going to the party, then here's the question you need to leave here with. Who are you going to bring with you? Who are you going to bring with you? I mean, it's a party, for goodness sake, and you can bring all your friends. Look, can I just be honest? If they gave me 100 master's tickets, I would take a bunch of you. Can't take all of you because there's more than 100 here, but I'd, I'd take a bunch of you. I'd take all my golfing friends and all the buddies that want to go. I'd be like, yeah, but I don't have that many. I don't have that many. I can't, I, I only take as many as I have tickets for. Guess what? The kingdom of God is a party. You're invited and you can bring all the friends you want. And why wouldn't you want to bring them? Because personally, I want everybody that I know at the party. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thanks for telling stories that 
that challenge us, that comfort us. God, I, I just praise you because you included me in your kingdom. I praise you that I'm invited to the party, um, that I'm wanted. That is such good news. Thank you. And I pray that you would fill every person in this room with your joy. I, I mean, I know that's your desire, that, that your joy would be in us and our joy would be full. So God, I pray that'd be a reality. Change our hearts, change our attitudes. Let us see that and live that. Uh, but God, I also pray that you would help us to look at the people around us who are missing out on the party, who are living joyless lives, who are struggling. And, and God, I pray that, that you'd open that door for us to be your servants and, and to bring more people. Good people, bad people, doesn't matter. Just people. Because you came to die to save people. And that's our mission, to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. And, and so, God, help us to see it, help us to do it, help us to be active in your name, we pray. Amen.